It's so good to see all of you here today. Just a wonderful, beautiful uh, congregation we have and so grateful for those who are with us in person and those who are able to join us by live streaming. Well, St. Augustine summed up what some say is the Christian life with these words. We are an Easter people and Alleluia is our song. Easter is a celebration, certainly a high point of the Christian year. And leading up to Easter are the 40 days of Lent, a time of preparation for this day going forward. There have been several ways that we have engaged Lent. Some have participated in our online platform and have enriched that discussion. And it's been a way for our online folks to join and participate as well. The Wednesday Lenten services each week have helped us focus our faith with, on, with spiritual practices to put our roots down just a little bit deeper. Just this past Thursday, we gathered around the love feast tables and we knelt to wash one another's feet and to extend our feet to be washed by the other. And together, we remembered with the bread and the cup. And then there's the box that you saw this morning. We've been dragging that around the sanctuary during Lent, and it's been a reminder that it opens new space to grow as followers of Jesus as we empty that box. And not only have we worked at lightening our own personal load, we've worked hard at lightening, at, at lightening our collective load, and our load has been significant. And now, we can't help but notice that there's just a bit more lightning in our midst. Something has lifted. There's a certain energy in this sacred place. And as we sing our alleluias, we celebrate together. And that seems right. Well, if your family's like ours, I imagine that some of us have celebrated already this morning with some chocolate, maybe a few marshmallow peeps, and this afternoon or evening, many, many people near and far will gather around full tables for a delectable feast. This is interesting. If you do a Google search for Easter dinner, you'll find countless websites and links and blogs featuring the next greatest dish. And it got me to reminiscing. Easter dinner. When I was growing up, we always, in fairness to everyone involved, split the holidays, Thanksgiving in one grandparent's home and Easter in the other, and then we'd alternate years. Christmas was somewhere in between. They were all memorable occasions for sure, but it's Easter dinner that I remember best in both of my grandparents' homes. Although I can still picture the way the table was set, the dishes that we used where each family member sat at the table and who said the grace, it's the food that was most memorable for me. When we were at my grandmother's house for Easter dinner, we always had a jello mold. And they do still make jello. I saw some in the, in the aisle the other day. It was made, she made it with big, juicy black cherries. Now, I'm sure there were other things for dinner, like maybe meat and potatoes and vegetables. But for me, at my grandmother's, it was all about the jello. On the other hand, at my Grammy's house, it was all about the homemade noodles with butter. Now, little did I understand or appreciate what was involved in making egg noodles from scratch, although I do remember Graham's antique hand-turned pasta maker watching her crank out those ribbons of noodles and hanging them on an old wooden drying rack. They were melting your mouth good, and it wouldn't have been Easter without Jell-O or without noodles. These many years later, in fact, I can tell that I'm starting to salivate. <laughs> these many years later, I still taste these Easter favorites. It's a real feast. So on this Easter day, we turn to scripture, to Isaiah's ancient poem, which begs the question, what's for dinner? From Isaiah 25. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, 
and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said that on that day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation, for the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain. In this powerful vision, the prophet Isaiah describes the generous work of God, and he begins with the promise of a generous banquet. And not merely generous, it's a real feast for all the people of the world. A feast of vintage wines and finest foods, maybe even seven courses with lavish, rich, rich gourmet desserts. And for everyone, no shortcuts here, God has pulled out all the stops for the grandest celebration ever. And I can only imagine that there was jello and homemade noodles. Isaiah knows that God's best work is celebrated with food, especially when the table has been painfully empty and the cupboards have been as bare as old mother Hubbard's for quite some time. This passage is a surprising interruption to a very painful and dire situation. The Israelites had gone astray, and Isaiah sees everywhere that things are falling apart. Just previous to this passage in scripture, in chapter 24, we read, the earth is polluted by its very own people who have broken its laws, disrupted its order, violated the sacred and eternal covenant. Everything has been laid waste, even the wine cellar. Isaiah says, no more wines, no more vineyards, no more songs or singers. The shouts of celebrants, gone. The laughter of fiddles, gone. Anarchy reigns. And then suddenly, right here in the middle of the book Isaiah, in the middle of all of that devastation and chaos and hunger, a great feast is announced. Nobody expects it. It comes as a complete surprise, a contrast of enormous magnitude. Somehow it signals that God is doing something new, and not just new, but shockingly new. Whatever distress, however deep the despair that the people have found their living, God promises to wipe away the tears from every face. And the people celebrate. They celebrate with a feast beyond the wildest imagination. There is hope beyond despair. And God has something to eat too. God, Isaiah says, will swallow up death forever. Some scholars say that this is mythical language. In Isaiah's day, one of the local Canaanite gods was named Mot, the local god of death. And Yahweh, the god of Israel, will finally swallow Mot, the death god who has, up until now, been consuming everyone else. Here is a battle between good and evil, a cosmic battle that the god of Israel is sure to win. We see much of this same language used in the New Testament to give voice to another astonishing experience. The Apostle Paul announces that Christ is risen, death is defeated, and death no longer has any power over God's people. Echoing the words of the prophet, he writes, death has been swallowed up in victory. And in the gospel stories, as we heard earlier, the women go to the tomb to care for their crucified Lord. They discover that the tomb where Jesus' body had been laid was open. There was nobody, no body inside. In their deep grief, they must have been distraught all the more, not understanding what had happened. Jesus was gone, but God is doing something new. They are about to discover that in God's reign, there is new life and there is hope beyond despair. As Isaiah describes this extraordinary meal, this feast, he sees that everything and everybody will be changed. All people shall eat, he says. All people shall have the death shroud destroyed. All the tears will be wiped away by God. In God's reign, there is hope beyond despair for every woman, man, and child. Hope beyond despair. We too, in some ways, have experienced despair like the people of Isaiah's day and like the women at the empty tomb. All is not well with humankind and with creation. As a people, we too have not cared for the earth as we should. 
We haven't treated it as a gift of God that it is, and we too see the effects. And yet, we also see glimmers of hope. Next Saturday, right here in Elizabethtown, there will be a festival to encourage environmental education. In the morning, our own youth group will be cleaning up the fairgrounds, and our climate change action group will host an eco-information table with lots of great ideas to care for God's good earth. We want to be a presence, joining others, joining with others in the community, proclaiming that our world matters, this world that God so loves. Hope beyond despair for a better and a cleaner and a healthier planet, and we can help to make a difference. God is doing a new thing. It is hope beyond despair when a congregation can raise over $7,500, as Jason shared with us, to help build a wall on the other side of the world, a wall that offers children a safe place, children of all ages who have otherwise been discarded by trafficking and those who would continue to abuse them. Today is Easter. It's a day of celebration. And we too are a people of hope beyond despair. In this season, millions of people across the world tell the grandest stories of all. For some, it's the story of Passover, recounting the exodus of the children of Israel from Egypt. And for others, for us as Christians, it is the story of the empty tomb and the promise of new life, the resurrection story. These stories bind us together. They bind us together to provide a sense of history and connectedness. They help us to see that we are not so different from the people of Isaiah's day who lived in deep, dark, desperate times. We are not so different from the grief-stricken women on their way to the tomb of the one that they desperately love. And we remember God's banquet, God's banquet meant for all, where there is a feast of rich food, well-aged wines, and God will swallow up death forever and God will wipe away all tears. And we will know hope beyond any despair. God is doing a new thing. And as I've been reflecting on Easter, on hope, of, on the, greatest, the great feast that God has for us, I thought again of Easter dinner gathered around my grandmother's tables, the jello and the noodles. And I realize now that it was far more than the food that had fed me. I knew I was part of a bigger story, a larger narrative. It isn't always easy or fun, but it is a human story. And I thought about the importance of story. We tell our stories of faith and we are encouraged by the stories of others, others who find hope in the midst of despair and in whom we find inspiration. And we share our own personal stories, not just the good and the happy stories, the human stories. We tell about the ups and the downs of life. I have two stories. The first is my Grammy of the homemade noodles story. Like many, my grandparents knew well the Great Depression. They grew up in rural Ohio and knew, that it was, knew what it was not to have much. Life was, touch, was tough. Grammy's mother died while she was a young child, and she had been raised by her two older sisters. Gramps grew up on a farm and knew the meaning of hard, hard work. As newlyweds, they found great treasure in things other than money, and they were oh so happy. When they married, they moved into a second floor apartment in a small Ohio town. It was sparse, but to them it was beautiful. One night after they had turned out the lights, they heard sirens and saw emergency lights just down the street. Their bedroom window opened onto a small roof and Gramps climbed out to see what all the action was. No sooner had he climbed out than Grammy shut and locked the window behind him. Ever the practical joker, she began to laugh and to wave at him through the window. And as Gramps realized his situation, he also found that he couldn't make much fuss because he didn't want to draw attention to the fact that he was scantily clad in jammies. <laughs> and so they laughed and they laughed, one on either side of that glass, until Grammy opened up the window so that Gramps could climb back in. From Grammy, I learned the importance of playfulness and of laughing together and of having fun. 
The next is my grandmother of the Jello story. Grandmother and grandfather also knew well what it was, what it was to come to, of age in the Great Depression. They fell in love, were married, and moved to the big city of Cleveland, Ohio for her grandfa for her grandfather's new job. There they found a small third floor apartment. They didn't have much and were able to furnish their new home with family heirlooms. An only child, grandmother's farming parents missed her terribly, far more than she could imagine when she left home. And so they made the drive to the big city to visit their daughter and her new husband. They knew the street on which they lived, but there were no house numbers. The newlyweds didn't yet have a phone, and no one had a cell phone of, in those days. So her parents drove up and down the street, hoping to find a way to locate them. And then they saw it. The old lamp that had once been theirs was in a third floor window. They had found the house and their daughter and their new son-in-law. And from grandmother I learned the importance of family, the need to stay connected and to keep searching, even when I don't have a house number. I miss my grandparents. They've all been gone for many years. But I remember, and I can still taste, jello and noodles. And I remember their stories of perseverance and hardships, mistakes and adversity and strength and setbacks and death and life and despair and hope. We were nourished, body, mind, and spirit, by the good food and by the stories. It was a glimpse of that feast declared by Isaiah, a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, a rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And we are reminded, in the midst of daily living, of whatever circumstances we find ourselves, that we have hope and the promise that God is doing a new thing, where all will have enough, where all will feast, death will be swallowed up forever, and the Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. And we know that indeed, we are an Easter, Easter people, and Alleluia is our song. So, sisters and brothers, rise and shine. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed.
this Saturday at the fairgrounds right here in Elizabethtown, Earth to E-Town. Join in the fun and learn how we can better take care of this beautiful planet that God has given us. The stone is rolled away. God is doing a new thing. And Jesus is here. Jesus is among us. Go in joy and go in peace.